Welcome everyone to our 2021 Emeriti virtual gathering. We have a terrific turnout. I am pleased and honored to preside over this gathering with such an exceptional group of Emeriti faculty who have helped to shape this university. I would also like to welcome our fellow deans and campus leaders who are attending this event. My name is Carmen Domingo and I have served this university for over 20 years first as a faculty member in the Department of Biology, and recently as the Dean of the College of Science and Engineering. I've had the pleasure of overseeing our college which serves over 7,000 majors and generates over 6,000 FTS each semester. Given the growing interest of students to pursue a career in STEM fields and our aging facilities, all of which were built in the 60s and 70s, I'm very pleased to share that we are making excellent progress in designing a new science building for our campus. Ken, can you please show the first slide? This is an image of the new science building from the perspective of 19th Avenue. It will be a five stories tall and will primarily house our School of Engineering and Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry. Next slide, please. To construct this new building, we will first demolish the east side of the existing science building. This demolition will begin this June. Next slide, please. As part of this project, the western portion of the science building will be renovated. Between this renovation and the new science building, we will create a 179,000 square foot science complex. Next slide, please. This image provides an aerial view, which shows how the Western portion of the science building will connect with the new science building, creating a wonderful science quad in the center as well as a working yard at the north end, which is adjacent to the engineering garage and machine shop. At the southern end of the new building, we will have the largest dynamic instructional hall serving 120 students in a space where all the tables and chairs will be movable, allowing for student-centered instruction. On the first floor, we will also have our student advising center, and our student enrichment office, which provides students with paid research experiences. On the second floor, we'll have a studio style chemistry instructional spaces where both the lab and lectures will be taught in an integrated fashion. This innovative approach to teaching has been shown to increase student success and retention in chemistry. On the third and fourth floors, we will have research and teaching spaces that support both chemistry and engineering faculty and students. The top floor will be housed by the College of Extended Learning along with our Dean's operation. Next slide, please. This diagram provides information on space utilization. We have programmed every part of the science complex to ensure that our students will develop the skills needed to meet the workforce needs as well as successfully enter future graduate programs. Next slide. We've spent approximately two years consulting with many stakeholders, faculty, students, staff, and administrators to design this building. We're using a design build approach, which means that we work with both the designers, Smith Group, along with the construction firm, DPR, from the onset of the project. This strategy has been very successful to ensure that the design fits within the budget constraints. Important goals were to make the building accessible and welcoming to everyone. Student success was central to our planning. Given the challenges of building new academic buildings in the CSU system, we recognize the importance of designing a building that would serve our needs for the next 50 years. With that in mind, our spaces are highly flexible, which will allow us to adopt and change space utilization over time. Next slide, please. Another important goal for us was to design a building that would be resource sufficient, high performing, healthy and energy efficient. Thus, we are aiming for a gold LEED certification. This will be our first academic all electric building on campus, which is very exciting as it is not very common among science buildings. Next slide, please. 
An important aspect of this building is the areas that we have created on every floor for students to hang out and learn with each other. These drawings depict what these spaces look like on each floor. This feature was particularly important to us as we do not have spaces like this in our current science buildings. And as a commuter campus, we want students to feel welcome to stay and engage with all of us as they develop their skills in science and engineering. Next slide. This image provides you with a view from the central quad. You can see the glass central spaces on every floor, which will house those open student hangout areas that I showed in the previous slide. Next slide, please. We are excited to launch a capital campaign called Catalyze the Future, which aims to raise $20 million for this project. Although we received significant funding for the construction of this building from the chancellor's office, it's not enough to ensure that we deliver the latest training environment and research opportunities for our students and faculty. I look forward to sharing updates with you as we break ground and begin construction on this project in the next few months. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jeff Jackinets. Jeff joined San Francisco State as VP for Advancement last year. Before his arrival at San Francisco State, he served as Vice President of Institutional Advancement at Mills College. And before Mills, Jeff spent over a decade at UC Berkeley in a range of advancement leadership positions. He earned a BA in English at, from the University of Chicago and a PhD in English from the University of Texas at Austin. Please welcome VP of Advancement, Jeff Jackins. Well, Carmen, thank you so much for the introduction and thank you all for uh, inviting me to be with you today. It's a real pleasure to, to join you all. Um, I am uh, still a relatively recent arrival to the San Francisco State community, but am thrilled uh, to be learning as much as I am and contributing in all the ways that I can uh, to the wonderful success uh, of this incredible institution. I, I do want to say in particular for this audience that faculty is a, is a key component of doing the work uh, that advancement does and a key component of driving my own interest um, in this work for, for over 20 years now. I consistently find myself, um, because of my interactions with faculty, uh, as stimulated and engaged uh, in incredible topics of great interest as I felt throughout my graduate program. Um, it's just a, a consistent and continual delight to have the chance to get to work with faculty, learn about their work, uh, and see firsthand uh, their commitment to students. Uh, on that topic as well, I also wanna share with you, I'm the proud parent of a current San Francisco State student. My daughter, Madeline, is a junior. She's majoring in political science and minoring in journalism. And that has been a, sort of a front row seat for me this past year in seeing the enormous extents and great lengths uh, to which faculty are going to keep students engaged and uh, on track towards degree completion during this in incredibly challenging time uh, of the past year. So I, uh, I, I, I suspect that all of you know this already, but the, the, the great me measures and lengths to which your, your uh, current faculty colleagues uh, at the university have gone to uh, move students in the university forward is, is just remarkable. Um, lastly, uh, before I introduce uh, President Mahoney, I, I want to thank the, the many, many of you who have continued to support uh, and engage uh, with the university even after your distinguished years of service. Uh, it means the world to us that so many of you um, continue to philanthropically support uh, the mission of the university through ongoing gifts that you make or by uh, provisions that you make for the university in your estate planning. And uh, we're, we're just tremendously, tremendously grateful for that. So now it's my pleasure to uh, turn and introduce uh, our extraordinary uh, president. Um, Lynn Mahoney is the 14th president uh, of San Francisco State and notably the first uh, woman president um, of the university. She came to San Francisco State 
previously having been uh, at two other CSU campuses. Immediately prior to joining San Francisco State, she was at Cal State LA where she served uh, as provost. Uh, and prior to that held a, an academic leadership position at Cal State Long Beach. Before that, she was uh, in the SUNY system back East uh, at SUNY Purchase. And she got her undergraduate degree uh, from Stanford and uh, her doctorate from Rutgers. She is a historian by training uh, and someone who uh, relishes and embraces the, the totality of the role uh, of leading this wonderful institution under all circumstances, but especially during these particularly challenging times. And it's just been a pleasure uh, for all of us to, to be working with her and helping move the university forward. So with that, uh, I will turn it over to you, President Mahoney. And again, thank you all uh, for being here today. Thank you, Jeff. It is uh, an honor to be with you this afternoon. Uh, and uh, looking at the, my background and looking at Jeff's background, it actually looks that way in San Francisco today. It's one of those absolutely spectacular days here. So um, I regret that we're not in person. Uh, I, I saw the images at the beginning of this, which were probably from the spring of 19. And um, I say with great enthusiasm, I can't wait until this is actually a lunch on campus together. Uh, I will apologize in advance. I met with the San Francisco State University Retirement Association this morning with retired faculty and staff. And so for emeriti faculty who also attended that, you get, you get to hear um, the same update twice. Uh, and I hope I, I, I hit what most of you would like to know about the university, but then of course there'll be time for Q&A. So first I'll just echo what uh, Jeff said. The last 13 months have been extraordinary in so many ways. I made a joke this morning, if I had announced at the beginning of my presidency that my plan was to move the entire university remote in a short period of time, I would probably not have lasted long enough to unpack my boxes. And yet that is in fact what this university did. Over about a two week period last spring, the faculty uh, moved their, all of their courses. At that point, it was every single one of our courses, 100% of our courses they were moved to online and electronic modalities. And shortly thereafter, we moved almost the entire work of the university. Um, we're generally a university of about 30,000 people. And over the past nine months or so, we average about 400 people a day on campus. And so what is remarkable is what we have accomplished. Uh, it hasn't been easy. The faculty, the staff, the administration, the students, it has not been easy, but it has been remarkable. And so. One of the, the things is we're gonna to return to a stronger university. Last summer in anticipation of a prolonged pandemic, 75% of our faculty participated in a professional development opportunity at the, center, at the Center for Excellence and Equity in Teaching and Learning. And you're gonna hear from the team at CEDL today. Uh, as Jeff noted, this is my fourth institution. This is hands down the best faculty professional development center I have ever worked with. It is remarkable. And um, with increasing frequency, faculty conversations talk about their work with CEDL. And if you can make this work, you're gonna bring back skills to face-to-face -to -face teaching that will be transformative. We've also found that some of our services are improved uh, remotely. Uh, our, our advising appointments increased by 20%. And so we're gonna look at ways to keep the best of what we've learned over the last 14 months and then return to the things that are really important that we do face to face. Um, for any of you who were department chairs or ever led an initiative, uh, we now do everything electronically, which has reduced the number of signatures. Some of you may remember days in the past where the signature page was longer than the document. And so we've, we've, we've found ways to streamline some of our bureaucracies too. So we're gonna return um, to a campus that in many ways, I believe will leverage what it learned to be a better and stronger university in support of our students. Uh, Dean Domingo already talked about the most exciting new project on campus, which is the new science building. Um, I've said this before and I'll keep saying it. As someone who was born uh, not long after that building opened, um, I'm hopeful that I and others have aged better than that building because I don't feel very old, but boy, does that building look really old. So it's going to be a game changer for student learning and for campus, the campus environment. But last August, we opened our, our newest resident hall in many years, Manzanita Square, on the corner of, of just across from the, uh, on Holloway, just across from the, the uh, administration building. 
It is spectacularly beautiful. And at some point, I hope to have you all on campus for a tour. We were able to partially occupy it this year, but we're looking at full occupancy for fall. <laughs> We uh, also just got our certificate of occupancy for our first fully new building, academic building, Marcus Hall for the liberal and creative arts. And um, Jason Porth had an opportunity to go in this week. And again, state of the art learning spaces that will provide our students with the opportunities they need to launch to have really incredible hands-on learning experiences, but then also launch careers. And that's on the, uh, on the end of that block. So with the new science building coming online, we are now anchoring the campus with new buildings that really um, point to the future, uh, point, point, point to the future. We have spent, uh, one of my observations, and again, Jeff noted that I've been at, at, at multiple CSUs and at a, a small public college back east, um, and they've all been wonderful in different ways. One of the things that distinguishes us, and this will come as no surprise, is that injustices nearby and global um, impact our community in ways that are different than other communities. Our students, our faculty, our staff, and our administration experience injustices near and far in very painful ways. And this year, of course, um, the pain has been near when we think most recently of the attacks on elder Asians here in the city of San Francisco and in the Bay Area. And so our work on campus climate has been really, uh, really critical this year. Uh, it, it always is. But even when you're just struggling with the isolation uh, that we've experienced through the pandemic, and given first the, the, the climate issues that we experienced during the last presidential uh, administration and campaigns, and then pandemic related, it's been hard. So um, I, just, I just wanna call out a few things. First of all, the work of our associated students. Our students remain as engaged and, as in, and passionate and determined to see change quickly and permanently uh, just as they were when you taught here. And again, you're gonna hear from CETA later today, but they have led the way in so many ways on, on inclusive pedagogies, resources for teaching, uh, in an, for anti-racist teaching, and, and you'll hear a lot about their work in a little bit. Last fall, we launched a comprehensive Black Lives Matter at San Francisco State initiative. And it was not just platitudes. It was not just a, a message of solidarity, though I do believe those are very, very important. Uh, and in fact, uh, in fact, that maybe Jeff or someone can throw in the chat room the link to Black Lives Matter at San Francisco State, and you'll see that we committed to real action and real change. We won't achieve it as quickly as many want, but it has been a concerted effort all year. We're in very regular and, and serious conversations with our Asian American studies uh, faculty, staff, and students about similar issues and about launching a no hate at San Francisco State initiative. Much of what we heard from our Asian American, uh, Asian and Asian American colleagues and students this past spring, we're also hearing from our Muslim and Arab communities, and we're also hearing from our Jewish communities, all of whom have suffered uh, an increase in white supremacist rhetoric, violence, harassment, and um, and so our work with those communities has been important. So we're working with uh, our Muslim and Arab students, our Muslim students in particular, right now on finding them prayer space all have expressed a concern about their personal safety. So we're looking at expanding a civilian service where our faculty, staff, and students can get escorts as, they, as they're moving through campus, particularly at, after dark. We're working with um, San Francisco Hillel on a comprehensive camp, uh, a campus climate initiative addressing and uh, documenting and addressing anti-Semitism. And then I just wanna give you an example of, of the kinds of things we're doing that we've always been great at. So there is a designation that a campus can achieve to be a welcoming campus for the LGBTQ plus community. And I was shocked when I got here that San Francisco State doesn't have that designation. Uh, and we deserve that designation. And as I looked around to see, well, what are we doing to, to be a welcoming and inclusive campus for, for those communities? I found out we were doing a lot in lots of different places. We had two or three different advisory groups, two or three different centers, Lots of work, but no campus synergy. And so we created, uh, the Vice President for Student Affairs and Enrollment Management created an advisory committee to bring these folks together, the, the different parts of campus, so that we can actually build on each other's work, not duplicate things in silos, but, but create synergy and, and become more impactful. So um, it has been a long, hard year. People are tired. Our faculty are tired. Our students are tired. Our staff, our administrators, 
everything you remember from a long academic year, you know, give some kind of exponent to, and there you have higher education during COVID. But um, I think we've learned a lot about ourselves. I think our students have learned a lot about themselves that we'll bring back gradually to a richer campus. So our attention now is on fall. Last year, we now last year, last feel every day is every week is a year. I'm looking at Carmen as I say that she knows what I mean. Uh, last week, we announced that vaccines will be mandatory for all students, faculty, staff, administrators, employees on campus in the fall. We don't yet know how we're going to document that or how we're going to enforce it. And the fall will be a transitionary semester. So it will only be required for people who will be working or teaching or learning on, on campus on the fall and others will have a little more time. Uh, California's done a great job with access, so we still have several months left too. But um, our goal is to offer as many classes as we safely can. Our students have indicated uh, that they, they want a mixture of remote learning and face-to-face. -face. Our first year students want face-to-face. -face. They wanna come, they wanna have that campus experience. Our continuing students have said, you know, this is working for me. I only have one semester left, or I really wanna mix. So um, we're, we're, we're moving towards a kind of a transitionary fall and then a hybrid future. Ultimately though, we are a face-to-face -face enterprise. So the majority of our students will return to campus, the majority of our staff will, the majority of our faculty will. But again, we're gonna look at ways to leverage technology to teach better, learn better, work better. Also perhaps reduce commuting times and allow a little bit more remote working for um, for, for folks uh, who can do it effectively, maybe only coming to campus three days a week. So um, we have a lot of work to do. It's been a long year, but I remain, what I know I will take away from this year is not the long days, not the being absolutely sick of seeing people in 25 boxes, but the energy, the resilience, the innovation, um, that'll stick with me and it will stick with us. So. Again, it's a pleasure to be here and I'm happy to entertain questions uh, as you'd like. And again, apologies for those of you who had to hear me twice. I'm not sure who's facilitating Q&A. Hi, President Winery, I'm facilitating Q&A. <laughs> so we already have a first question in the chat. Um, how will you determine which classes will be in person, which on Zoom and which hybrid? So the first thing we did for face, we, we decided who we needed to prioritize for face-to-face -face classes. And we were looking at our first year students because nationally the, the, the um, information was they wanna, they wanna be on campus. And then we surveyed them and 91% or 92% want face-to-face. -face. But we also prioritized uh, our seniors and senior capstone experiences, their last chance to get hands-on learning here at, at, at State. And then we also prioritized programs that really it was hard for. Um, you know, some, at some point, perhaps in the future, we can get Dean Domingo to have some of our faculty do a presentation on the remarkable way that they were able to do some uh, laboratory work remotely, right? Something we thought was impossible or very hard. We've done a lot of innovation, but we are prioritizing getting people back into, you know, the theater, the, the dance um, studios, our labs, uh, you know, things that, that, that would benefit that. Uh, and now we're, we're kind of doing a second stab. We're doing a second round to get some more face-to-face -face classes. And we're looking for upper division general education, upper division disciplinary courses for juniors and seniors. So it's going to be a mix. Um, and then it was personal preference. We had some faculty who really want to come back. This, they've just had enough. They're done. Especially once we announce mandatory vaccines. We've got other faculty though who have, or have complicated lives or who's, if this is really working for, who want to be remote. So, it's been a very, um, our department chairs are my heroes at the moment. It has been very hard. And um, actually a follow-up to that, do you anticipate a specific role for Professor Emeriti at SFSU? So um, I guess I'm gonna, I'm gonna do that therapist thing and, <laughs> and, and flip the question right back. Um, I want to see, and, and I had a conversation with retired faculty and staff today on ways in which maybe we have not been as accommodating as we could to facilitate your engagement. But uh, we, we want your engagement. Uh, our students need your engagement. And so um, I guess I would ask that question back to all of you. How can we best leverage the amazing resource we have in our Emeriti faculty? And, and Jeff and I took some notes this morning about some of the kind of bureaucratic things that maybe we can help with. But um, I don't have a specific, obviously there's mentorship, there's all sorts, you know, collective wisdom, um, historical institutional knowledge. 
But um, I would love to have that conversation with the Emeriti faculty about where, uh, how best can we uh, help you be engaged and, and, and help us meet our students' goal. And I think we only have time for one more question. And I actually got one privately messaged to me. Um, what are you most looking forward to about returning to campus? Uh, so I'm going to be honest. I'm just like everybody else is. I am both excited about returning, a little bit anxious. I have not been in a room with a group of people in a very long time. Um, and I'll just just to, to start with one of the things I will uh, I, that has been kind of a, a lifesaver during the last year. Um, as a provost and then as a president, I did not get to eat dinner with my husband very often. And so we are now on our, we've been trying to keep track, I don't know, like 398th consecutive dinner together. And we still like each other. And we also eat lunch together. Now I think that's because he knows I'll make his lunch so he waits for me, but it's still a pleasure. So while I will miss that, what I'm looking forward to most is just walking around a busy campus. When you're on campus now, it's beautiful. Our groundskeepers, our facilities folks, it just looks beautiful. And our neighbors love it. They're walking their dogs all over campus, but a campus shouldn't be empty. So I think what I'm most looking forward to is walking around campus and those serendipitous moments where you talk to a faculty member or to a staff member or a student. Um, this is fine for just having a meeting, but you know, there's richness, it's the richness is missing. So for me, it's those informal moments of, um, walking around on campus and seeing my colleagues and my students. That's a great question, whoever asked it. And thank you very much for having me today. Thank you so much, Dr. Mahoney, for your leadership and all that you're doing for our university. As I was looking at your backdrop, I was thinking I was missing going to get my coffee and then going to get the burrito and then walking across and bumping into people. And I just, I just can't wait to come back. And I know I speak for all of my colleagues. Uh, next, we're excited to introduce a presentation from the Center for Equity and Excellence in Teaching and Learning. The title of the presentation is The Future of Teaching is Social Justice. Student success in the global era of racial health and economic pandemics. Please welcome Dr. Maggie Beers, the Assistant Vice President for Teaching and Learning and the President of the CSU Faculty Development Council, and Dr. Wei Ming Dariotis, Faculty Director of the Center for Equity and Excellence in Teaching and Learning and Professor of Asian American Studies in the College of Ethnic Studies. Thank you so much for your kind introduction, Dr. Um, Dean Domingo. I'm going to start with uh, something that we're doing now in CETL called a context and positionality statement. And that is, it is inspired by the relationships and congruences between pronoun declarations and land acknowledgements. And it performs many functions, including identifying aspects of one's identity that may be unperceived by others to help find points of connection. It identifies your awareness of relationships of power, both institutional and personal, and it helps us to bring our whole selves to our shared work. The following example also performs the functions of modeling vulnerability and showing that our identities shift and develop over time. So my name is Wei Ming Dariotis, and although I'm very comfortable being addressed as Wei Ming by colleagues in informal settings, my late colleague and dear friend, Dr. Don Mabalan, taught me that as a woman of color, I'm an aspirational role model for other women and feminine identified people, and thus I should claim my title. So my preferred form of address by colleagues in formal settings is Dr. Dariotis. I explain this shorthand as any situation in which you would use the formal title of a white man, please use mine. I'm a full professor of Asian American studies, which makes me one of 2% of full professors across the nation in any discipline who are Asian American women. I'm an affiliate faculty with the Educational uh, Leadership Doctoral Program and faculty director of CETL, the Center for Equity and Excellence in Teaching and Learning. I identify as a Chinese, Greek, Swedish, cisgender, bisexual, queer woman. I was raised in San Francisco, where I currently live and work on the unceded, unyielded territory and traditional home of the Rometush Ohlone people, whose work and creativity in shaping this land, its plants and animals for 15,000 years, impacts me and my family daily. 
We, a Black, Asian, European, American Indian mixed race family, live in San Francisco's Bayview District because it is one of the last places of refuge for the 5.2% of San Franciscans who are Black. Living here, we recognize the deep segregation of this city due to its histories of redlining and current forced shiftings of populations. I appreciate this indigenous tradition of land acknowledgements, which non-indigenous people have been being requested to honor for hundreds of years, because I am as ashamed of not having known as a child the names of the Ohlone peoples as I am of having teased my Chinese mother for her inability to say words like Palo Alto. I use the pronouns she, her, and the Chinese gender neutral pronoun ta, despite my imposter syndrome as someone who only studies Chinese, as a way of reclaiming the mother tongue I once rejected. At the San Francisco State Faculty Retreat in January 2021, Rometush Ohlone representative Greg Castro asked our community to take care of the land and to take care of each other. It is my intention today to honor that request. And now I turn it over to my dear colleague, Dr. Maggie Beers. Thank you very much for that introduction. I'm a mom, daughter, spouse, friend, mentor, educator, and administrator. I was born and raised in a middle-class subdivision in West San Jose in a neighborhood of identical single-story homes in a neighborhood engineered to be white and Catholic, built on former agricultural land of walnut orchards and strawberry fields on the displaced land of the Ohlone and Awaswas people, a region now referred to as Silicon Valley. I am trilingual and trinational by choice, an identity I was able to make for myself through my privileged access to education and opportunity and motivation to move beyond the white monocultural life I was born into. I recognize the power and responsibility I hold, which comes from my race, white, my gender, cisgender female, sexual identity, heterosexual, and university position administrator. I am deeply committed to social justice and liberatory pedagogies, values my parents introduced to me, and that I have reinforced in my educational and professional pursuits. Thank you for allowing me to share this space with you today. So those were our um, somewhat non-traditional introductions. And I think it's an introduction to a, a non-traditional year and one whose lessons we will take with us moving forward. Uh, as we're here celebrating your status as emeritus faculty, I'd like to introduce you to the newest cohort of tenure tenure track faculty who Dr. Dariotis and I had the honor to spend five days, that's 40 hours fully online with this last August as we explored the social justice mission and inclusive teaching approaches at SF State. We asked them to share their feelings at the start of the five-day orientation, which may be similar to those you felt as you joined San Francisco State for the first time. And then we asked them at the very end of our time together what they will take away. As you can see, they deeply understood the deep connection to social justice and the compassion that we hold for our students. Those are both values that, that drew them to San Francisco State and they were, it was nice to see that we reinforced them in our time together. In the next 15 minutes, we'll be sharing with you the CEDL mission and guiding strengths of our somewhat um, new center. We're about four years old now. The rapid and compassionate campus response to the global racial health and economic pandemics that disproportionately plagued the very communities that San Francisco State serves, and future directions to further develop and support anti-racist inclusive approaches to teaching and learning in support of our students and their personal, academic, and professional success. When it was first conceived, uh, the Center for Equity and Excellence in Teaching and Learning 
the planning force uh, in 2015 proposed this mission, that the Center for Equity and Excellence in Teaching and Learning is the heart of the university's commitment to a culture that values and rewards teaching, supports diversity among learners, and promotes learning environments that foster social justice and the respectful and vigorous exchange of ideas in which students and faculty thrive and succeed. As we heard earlier from, from President Mahoney, this has been a year like no other. We have experienced together as a community, three simultaneous um, compounding pandemics. The health pandemic brought to us by COVID-19 and the mental health and disparate access to vaccines that we're now experiencing. The, the global pandemic of racism, especially illustrated by Black Lives Matter and the Stop AAPI Hate um, crimes and reactions that we experienced, and also the socioeconomic hardships that came from uh, job loss, a digital divide that became all too uh, apparent, not only in our, in our students, but also in our, our lecturer faculty and staff, and also basic needs of our students. Throughout this year, we have come to see CEDL's guiding strengths as threefold, and they mirror the, the same strengths that we want our faculty to also uh, foster within their students and with, within their teaching. The first is CEDL is deeply committed to inclusion and belonging. We have a deep advocacy for justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion through our anti-racist liberatory pedagogies. And we are also inclusive and foster a sense of belonging for all of our adjunct faculty, lecturer faculty, graduate teaching assistants, anybody who is uh, involved in the teaching mission at SF State. We also approach faculty development as we hope our faculty approach teaching and learning with a growth mindset, with holistic support for lifelong learning about teaching that connects the mind, body, and spirit. And also based on evidence-based practice, a commitment to student success through reflective data-informed practices grounded in the scholarship of teaching and learning, a discipline unto itself. We offer um, faculty events, which have now moved virtual into a virtual environment, also faculty support services and faculty development curriculum for faculty. Those all of which were called into um, deep need over the last year. As, a, as an effort to uh, foster community and to share our life experiences, we launched the CEDL Circles newsletter, which is a monthly newsletter that features the voices of our faculty and the fantastic work that they are doing on behalf of our students and also in building community amongst themselves. I invite you to read the, the past issues and also subscribe. Earlier, President Mahoney mentioned our reach at 75%. It has now grown to 80%, which is unheard of in actual um, university reach in terms of faculty development. An aspirational reach standard for faculty development is 20% of faculty engagement. So this 80% includes both lecturer faculty and tenure track faculty. To the right are just some of the the, the numbers that mark the uh, incredible response that our faculty have shown in their, in their passion to um, continue to learn about teaching and how they can best support their students. So 90 hours of faculty development curriculum, for example, was made available to the faculty. All of that was created in-house and, and grounded in the context of, of San Francisco State. From that, our in just since March 2020, our camp, our faculty have completed, that means we have verified and documented and paid them for 44,603 hours of professional development, largely carried out in their time that would normally be off um, contract. So this shows an incredible commitment. And those of you who are, who care about those things, it just, far surpasses our sister campuses in the CSU. Another very impactful program was our course redesigns. This demonstrated the future direction of pedagogy, which grounds our courses in the real lived experience of our students. So these course redesigns impacted 16,000 students. 
to give you um, an idea of three of these 48 projects, Finance 350 changed the course context from corporate to personal finance since a nationwide lack of financial literacy contributes to and perpetuates wealth inequity. Criminal Justice 330 emphasized critical thinking skills that enable analysis of crime, law and social justice systems, excuse me, justice systems and the structural ways they shape race, class, age, sexuality and gender. And theater arts changed the frame from theater as a luxury to theater as a necessary tool for voicing one's own narrative. Those again are only three of the 48 projects that had a dramatic impact on all of our students. When asked uh, what was the most supportive um, resource that faculty found in making that extreme two week pivot uh, to remote instruction that has continued on now for, for 12 months, uh, the first response was faculty appreciated the CETL faculty development programs and consults. And I will say that the way that we we developed these faculty development programs was they themselves were communities. So for example, one of our courses had has 12,000 faculty members enrolled in it at the same time. They were able to see each other, talk to each other. So it was a definite, uh, a virtual campus of sorts. Um, next, they appreciated the peer mentorship that came within their departments and also the departmental um, discipline specific support that they received. Finally, this um, may not be as accurate now that the vaccine has been approved and we now have the new mandate that uh, we will be requiring vaccines. But this just goes to show the radical shift that faculty have felt in terms of their teaching preference. Prior to, we asked the faculty, prior to um, the COVID pandemic, what was your preferred teaching modality? 62% said in-person, fully in-person, and only 3% said fully in line, uh, full online. When we asked those same faculty, what, thinking about fall 2021, when you would be teaching with masks and social distancing requirements, 64% they would prefer said they would prefer fully online and only 10% in person. Now, of course, there are health and safety conditions, but I think that also shows that there is a definite um, hybrid future, as President Mahoney uh, mentioned earlier. Now, I'd like to pass this over to Dr. Dariotis to give some examples of some of the um, faculty development programming that was um, contextualized within this year. So last year, a year ago, right after CETL had finished, um, well, was in, had just done the instructional continuity plan and created resources to maintain instructional continuity, then the uh, George Floyd murder and the resulting social unrest really brought to light the need to address uh, racism through our pedagogical approaches. And we very quickly, we were able to reach out through our already existing campus expertise and our already existing CETL framework of equity and excellence to bring together a group of incredible experts uh, to develop the, what we call JEDI Institute. And that is justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion in online pedagogies of inclusive ex excellence. And uh, if we go to our next slide, um, we can see we've now had um, three cohorts of uh, the JEDI Institute and it's developed and been enriched in each iteration. And the first group, which was last summer, the first cohort was about 100 faculty who were certified and all told we've had close to 300 faculty um, get certified in uh, the JEDI uh, pedagogies. And this has spawned many other types of activities across campus as faculty become interested in, and more knowledgeable about these issues. Um, so the JEDI Institute, <clears throat> is based around uh, the following learning outcomes, that participants will identify and assess their personal goals for anti-racist pedagogy practice in online teaching, 
that they will examine and demonstrate knowledge of historical and contemporary institutional and individual racism, as well as white supremacy and education practice that they'll assess their current assignments, assessments and teaching practices through critical race perspectives. And finally, that they'll design strategies for inclusive and equitable engagement. So the program is really designed to help them create things that they can use right away in their courses and create community in the process of doing so. So if we look at our next slide, we'll get a tiny peek inside. Um, this is one of the modules. There are 10 modules ranging from everything from how to create a welcoming and inclusive in, um, environment at the beginning of the course to how to get to know your students uh, through surveys and things like that, um, how to incorporate land acknowledgements into your courses, decentering whiteness, looking at your own positionality as a form of pedagogy thinking about educational debt as a framework rather than education or equity gaps, um, re-examining student workload and thinking about who is that ideal student that you're imagining when you, when you organize your course workload and how can knowing our students better help us better manage student workload in order to maximize student success a really important module on believing our students um, and what we call a Jedi syllabus remix. So really looking at the syllabus as a way to uh, increase equity in the classroom. Um, if we look at our um, next slide, we have an example of one of the more energizing um, modules, which was on land acknowledgements. And this was energizing for our participants because many of them felt reluctant at first when the idea was introduced to them uh, to do land acknowledgements for fear that it was merely pro forma or performative and that it didn't have a deep meaning attached to it. And in the process of, of working through these resistances, and engaging and doing their own uh, land acknowledgements, I think many of them actually found that it is a, a kind of transformative practice in teaching um, and have found ways to adapt it, uh, as I did in terms of creating a context and positionality statement into something that is more widely meaningful for them. And on our next slide, you can see the engagement uh, that they have with each other as a community in the process. So in this conversation and community, you'll see on the side that there are um, sometimes nine or 10 posts as people talk back and forth with one another about the kinds of uh, statements that they're making. Um, so I'll just read the last paragraph of this uh, sample land acknowledgement. Those who are not members of this group are encouraged to recognize their position as guests on this land, extending respect, reverence, and gratitude to the Ohlone peoples and Mother Earth as we all benefit from the beauty and abundance of this place. I found it particularly inspiring that faculty from disciplines as widely variant as tourism, mathematics, economics, and supply chain management would find ways to incorporate land acknowledgements into their pedagogy in a meaningful way. And on our next slide, um, this leads to our, um, the other side of faculty development work, which is the assessment of teaching effectiveness. And over the last year, the Academic Senate has launched uh, with our support the T task force, a teaching effectiveness assessment task force. It has been long known that there are many kinds of biases inherent in the student evaluation process, the student evaluation of teaching effectiveness process. And also if we are trying to support faculty development towards anti-racist teaching goals, then it is also necessary to pair that faculty development with assessment processes that value that type of teaching. Uh, and so the T task force has been working uh, since I believe no November uh, in partnership 
also with the CFA uh, to develop a system of teaching effectiveness assessment that really looks at anti-racist approaches. Uh, can we look at the next slide, please? Mm -hmm. Uh, so it is the purpose of the T task force is to address limitations and propose equitable and just solutions to the current system of teaching effectiveness assessment. Uh, and to make explicit the implicit understandings, assumptions and expectations for what constitutes effective teaching at SF State and to support faculty in achieving these outcomes to ensure student success. And so similarly in line with the growth mindset uh, value that CETL has, the teaching effectiveness assessment uh, model that we're that is being developed uh, will have a strong component of um, growth mindset aspect to it. And so with the support that we've been able to provide faculty confidence in inclusive teaching strategies has really um, developed on our campus 82% feel confident in uh, being able to implement these strategies and 65% have expressed interest in seeking further support around all of these types of student success strategies. Right. Maggie, did you want to address uh, the timeline? Yes, thanks. So we're, we put this in just to, just to panic you all, um, just to give you a, a, a just sort of a, it's a visual that shows how all of these were successive, one event after the other, everything from um, our student success and graduation initiative, which is still happening that started in 2015 and, and hoping to um, meet our goals by 2025. And we continue to work on those amongst all of these other um, pressing needs and so we are grateful to work within the CSU because the CSU has been very proactive in terms of setting us up for success by by making calls early about moving online and maintaining the health and safety of our faculty and our students and staff front and center so um, this was to give you an idea of just how how hard um, your colleagues have been working um, to support the students um, these are some of our future directions, um, but I think at this point we can uh, open if you have any questions. Hi, Maggie. So I think we only have time for one question, but um, I think one of the questions that I got uh, privately messaged, and you both certainly touched on this, but maybe if you could talk about some of the silver linings um, from this past year for the two of you as you had to pivot to this more virtual modality and then maybe also combine that with what are you most looking forward to now that we're perhaps getting more ready to come back onto campus what are the things that you're most looking forward to in that mm -hmm. um, in terms of silver linings i'll start with um, some of you may remember me as director of academic technology and um, i've moved out of that role and i'm in faculty affairs and fully focused on teaching and learning. And so what, and that is for me back to my, my heart, which is um, teaching. And so for me, the silver lining is that teaching is, I think that we've all come to an understanding as a campus that teaching is teaching um, and that there are benefits to all of the different modalities. And so I think that that conversation um, is one that we needed to confront often, but now, as a campus, we're focused on what is best for the students, what is the best mode, what is the best condition. And so a lot more flexibility there. Um, also, I'm really grateful for our leadership in President Mahoney and Jennifer Summit um, because they have a deep commitment to faculty development and have made these resources available so that we could be successful and have advocated for us in terms of finding us the stipend um, from CARES and also um, looking forward to another round. So I really think that a silver lining was as horrible um, as this year has been. I think San Francisco State was well positioned to respond to it in such a positive way because of our, our values, because of our leadership and because of the, the heart that our faculty have for our students. So for me, 
that was my silver lining. And I got to stay home with my daughter who's a senior in high school and that was, that's been special. Winning. I don't think I could say it any better than, than you have, Maggie. It has been um, a challenge and also a pleasure to be able to see everybody rising to that challenge. Mm -hmm. And there, a lot of those challenges have been very personal. Mm -hmm. and, and to see the, the way that we've been able to pivot together mm -hmm. and, and, and meet that and express compassion, ex you know, be able to share our passion for doing this work. I, I couldn't couldn't imagine a better response than than what we've had on our campus. It has really been inspiring. It has. Thank you both so much. I think we only have time for the one question, so I will go ahead and turn it back to Dean Domingo. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Beers and Dr. Dariotis, for such a lovely and thoughtful presentation. I know I speak on behalf of all the college deans of just our deep, deep appreciation for the support you provided our faculty. That was such a huge move, as you showed in your data, and, and you've transformed us. We're going to come back different, and that huge impact was, was driven by CEDAL, so just in deep gratitude. Next, it is my pleasure to welcome Steve Kelton, Director of Plan Giving. Thank you, Dean Domingo. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm really happy to see, uh, I know most of you, some of you I don't know, and I'm really happy to see you in attendance today. Um, I'm Steve Kelton, as, as Dean, Dean Domingo said, I'm the Director of Plan Giving, and I'm here along with my colleague, Tom Mullaney, who many of you know. And um, one fact about Tom is he has been hunkering down with his family in Chicago for the entire pandemic. And they just got a third golden doodle puppy. So I was like, Tom, I don't think you're ever coming back. I don't know, I'm not sure. Um, but anyway, they're having a lot of fun with their puppy. Um, so Tom and I are the directors of plan giving here on campus. There are just the two of us. That means that we help donors uh, to leave bequest gifts in their living trusts and wills. And we also create life income gifts like charitable gift annuities and charitable remainder trusts. Um, and that's for the benefit of all areas of the university, all the colleges, including athletics and the library. So it's a really exciting time here at uh, SF State, as you've heard today. And one, uh, by the way, I wanted to uh, let you know that in our two new buildings, the Science Building and the Marcus Hall for the uh, Liberal and Creative Arts, there are naming opportunities in both of those buildings to name rooms, to name laboratories. There's also a need, as Carmen said, we got uh, money from the Chancellor's Office to build the building, but not for, anything inside the building. So there's a need for um, equipment for the labs, for the, for the Becca uh, studios. So if, if that's something that you're interested, we're happy, we'd be happy to discuss that with you at, at any time. And uh, one statistic you might not know is that Ameriti are really one of our largest group of donors. And it, it makes sense if you think about it. You, you've spent a career teaching here. So you're, we know you're connected to the university and your colleagues and you're generous in spirit, particularly to your students. And a many emeriti who are on this call with us today and also others um, are donors and we thank you for that. But for those of you who aren't yet, um, when considering making a gift, we obviously want you to take care of your family and your loved ones first, but we'd like you to also include a gift for the university. And we receive gifts of all sizes and any size gift is much appreciated and valued and helps our students and programs tremendously. And there are many ways for you to become a donor that you may not be aware of. And so I just wanted to outline a few of them. Uh, one is giving a current gift that you're aware of, of any amount with cash securities, or th through, excuse me, the very favorable IRA charitable rollover. 
uh, which several of you on this call have, have benefited from. You can also name us a beneficiary on a retirement or an investment account or a life insurance policy. You can create a charitable gift annuity, which gives you a stream of income. And we also accept gifts of real estate. And I suspect many of you didn't realize that. Now, you may be more inclined to leave a bequest gift in your will or trust. And one of the functions that Tom and I have is to help donors work out the details of their bequest gifts so that they can ensure that their gift is going to go exactly where they want it to go. And we can provide language for your attorneys that the attorney can drop right into your living trust or your will. An easy way for you to become a donor is if you already have a gift in your estate plan and you haven't let us know. Um, when you let us know, we can officially thank you, welcome you into our Roberts Legacy Society. We count your gift and we invite you to our yearly legacy event. Also, if you're currently giving to a particular program or funding a scholarship, an estate gift is an excellent way to further fund that after you're gone, creating a legacy for both yourself and your family and impacting so many more students. And if you prefer with all these gifts, you can tell us that you wanna be private and anonymous about your giving. We have many donors who, who uh, choose that option. Lastly, when I talk to Emeriti and ask them how they're enjoying their retirement, the usual res response I get is they're busy as ever. They are enjoying it, but they miss the interaction and energy of their students. Does that sound familiar? I suspect it does. Many of you have told me that. Um, I propose that giving is a way to continue to be involved with the programs and students that are important to you and will have an impact on them and their fam families for generations to come. By giving, you create a legacy that solidifies your place at the university. Many Emeriti have done just that. Please know that we appreciate a gift of any size and it helps our students tremendously. We'll have a slide at the end with contact in info for us to help. You can also talk to your college's gift officers if you like. With that, I ask you, well, we ask you to please join us by giving and helping our students and programs get to the next level. Thank you very much. Back to you, Carmen. Thank you, Steve, so much for sharing this important information with us. Uh, it's really important for the livelihood of our campus. Um, before closing, I would like to thank Charlene Del Moro and the event staff, Ken Maishiro, and Nisha Shosh McGrath uh, for their contributions and assistance. Thank you, Emeriti faculty, for coming and for all that you continue to do to support San Francisco State. I look forward to seeing you next year, if not sooner.